another car. Meanwhile, with that, a PhD student here, uh, back in 91. I think he still holds the record for the shortest time as a PhD student, only two years. So, uh, yeah, he got his degree. There's a years. star next to that, though. <laughs> <laughs> we won't discuss that. Yeah, no, that's right. And in the meantime, Ask he's won uh, several awards. You know, he's done very nice work on smooth analysis and the Grappel-Blossians that he told us before. But of course, uh, you know, he only did one, so of course he's in the meantime gone off and worked on many other things, including game theory and a bunch of other topics, which is what we'll get to talk to her today. Thanks. Shane, it's all yours. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Gary. Uh, so, uh, I choose this time to come back to visit, also in part because it's, a, you know, Gary's 70th birthday. So, uh, you know, when you serenade for your advisors, I figure, I need to sing twice. So this is a part two of singing. Yeah. Uh, so, so since I, you know, that's one of the purposes I come back to with this CMU. So let me just start with a very simple story about Gary, then hopefully I can connect to this talk. So in 91, in my last year, I, you know, CMU suddenly asked us to TA twice. So, so I have to sign up for one more class to TA <coughs> in, in my second, uh, last year. So I was teaming for John Reynold on the so-called theory of programming language. And <clears throat> one day, Gary ran into me and John, was <laughs> looking at John's book, and Gary asked uh, John, so what is this field about? And John said, you know, it's about using mathematical concepts, such as set theory, and so on, to define the semantics of programming language. And for those you know Gary, you know, he's uh, very creative, imaginative, and sometimes provocative. And, and he immediately said to John that, uh, you know, in 10 years, the kids will learn programming language way before they learn set theory. Probably, it's more meaningful to teach them set theory based on programming language. <laughs> so I think John smiled very awkwardly. You know, John always <laughs> smiled very awkwardly. And uh, since he's my last year's PhD student, you know, you, you remember that uh, when you just graduate from high school, you go, to, go on to college, you no longer feel embarrassed about your parents. You already began to see the wisdom of your parents. So I was not totally embarrassed by Gary at that time. I was in my last year. <laughs> and I really see the wisdom of such statement. I didn't quite follow, for example, what is a programming language and set theory, but at least I can use one thing to illustrate what Gary said actually is totally right, okay? So, <clears throat> you know, we all know we love graph theory, right? It's, a, it's one thing we study. And uh, one thing nice about the graph theory is that uh, in modern days, suddenly we enter the age of network. And uh, 20 years ago, when internet came out, math came out, the set theories came out to say, don't worry, it's nothing new, it's just a graph. Right, so we try to use graph to define internet, define web, web is directly graph. And then 20 years flew by. Now, for example, when I teach my class, I said, don't worry about the graph theory. It's just a Facebook. <laughs> it's a bad. So, so it's exactly what Gary said, right? Kids learned about <coughs> network before they learned about the graph theory, right? So I would like to purposefully to distinguish a network is what people see today, and the graph theory, graph is what we study, right? So clearly, by expressing network as a graph, we go beyond the just graph representation. It comes with many other mathematical structures and algorithms and concepts, right? But if you really talk to folks in the field about network analysis, network science, I think the first thing they will tell you is a network is not just a graph. Network is beyond graph, right? So, so network is far more than the graph representation. Right? Just that, you know, the <coughs> programming language is not a set theory. It's far more complicated than set theory. So if you really look at real world network data, they are very rich and multifaceted. In fact, if you look at the display of so-called web 2.0, they don't even draw a graph anymore. Right. But clearly it's a graph theoretical components in network data, right? So, so, so to a largely speaking, you know, network analysis is trying to understand 
this sort of multifaceted network data, not just the graph concept. Right? So, so, uh, so to a large degree, like today's talk, I would like to pull a few uh, areas that I really love uh, and uh, try to focus on a very simple problem in network analysis. And I will try to touch upon the basics of network analysis, some application of game theory, and also it has you know, what we theorists study, an efficient algorithm. Right? So this will be the three facets of today's talk. So, so one of the fundamental challenge of the richness of network data it is, it is that it implicates how we define network concepts. Because traditionally, we will go to a graph, and then we try to use a graph theory to introduce a network concept. But then we realize, when you talk to practitioners, they often say, it didn't match what the experiments. You know, normally, I don't understand the experiments in the first place, but they told me, whatever you study didn't match. Right? So, so for example, network concept simply means like you, know, you have some centrality. I give you a network. You want to figure out who is more important. Clearly, this has been used in web search and the variety of network analysis, right? And even this simple concept is very complex because if you read the literatures, there are more than 20 to 30 definitions of network centrality. Perhaps the most familiar one to us is a page rank, right? It's an example of network centrality. And if you go down to a much <coughs> more bigger structures, like communities or subsets, so called classability, I think it, the, the definition becomes even more murky. Uh, the gap between theory and practice, between mathematics and the experiments are really diverging. Right? So, so to a larger degree, uh, we fundamentally try to understand when we see a network, what is the fundamental interaction model? Right? It may not be just that graph. Right? So, so for example, Page rank is one of the popularly used centrality, right? That is, uh, you take a network, you produce a vector, and the, the value will somehow measure the importance, right? And uh, when people define this, actually, they explicitly assume something happening on the network, right? They define it as a random walk. So they actually didn't say it's a graph concept, it's actually a sort of uh, action of uh, or interplay between random walk on the graph, right? And uh, when people try to define so-called betweenness, they try to use the flow model, and later on they can get many more complex definitions. For example, related to percolation from many different aspects, or or even from statistical uh, aspect. So they give very different formulas. But each group actually argue for their centrality. If you say mine is better than yours. He said, why is because it matched my own intuition, <laughs> right? So, so <clears throat> if you move on, for example, if you think, think about bigger structure, in theoretical computer science, I think we're all essentially familiar with conductance, right? To us, conductance is natural to measure class stability. <laughs> but if you go on, there's also hundred definitions about what is good community and the class stability, right? And again, each argue for their merit. So actually, the first time I'm thinking about this type of issue is because uh, when Dan <coughs> and I began to develop this local algorithm for clustering, I figured that's probably the most practical work I ever did. So I go out and began to give a talk to say this is good for clustering. And immediately, someone raised his hand to say, why do you use conductance? I said, that sounds like a great idea. It's beautiful mathematically. He said, it didn't capture practice. Why don't you use modularity? At that time, all I remember, I said, what is modularity again? Then he said, this is a statistical view of a network. And it's great. It's really much our intuition. So, so after a few of such talks, I realized that you know, I have very limited judgment on this. And it's good to read more about at least what other people define. Then I began to realize that often they also define based upon their sort of slice or facet of network. They said, this network, I believe, look like this. The fundamental interaction is like this. And therefore, I want to define it this way. Right. So I would like to take a step a little bit uh, back to say how actually we at least capture some of things beyond a graph. Right. 
And if you look at a few of the examples I mentioned, <coughs> fundamentally, I would like to, at least as a first order or zero order, to say the reason why a lot of network concept is complex is because fundamentally, people think that something else is also happening on the network. They may not do it explicitly, they sometimes do it ex implicitly, right? So, so for example, what is the dynamic process on the network? I don't know, it's something happening on the network. For example, if you trace this curve, you can go from you to your neighbor, you can do, go to your neighbor. These often we call random walks. And this type of interaction produces distributions, and then we use this to define conductance, or central, or page rank, <coughs> right? Or you can see some other motions. Suppose I, I start with two circles, and every time you have, if I have a triangle facing two circles, I can expand, and people say this is dynamic of social influence. And clearly this looks different from the other dynamics because sometimes you can go from one node to two nodes. Right? It doesn't conserve anymore. Right? Random walk makes conservation of mass. Right? So you can see they do make different assumptions. And uh, this, for example, broadly, is related to one of the, this sort of dynamic model often defined on network called social influence or viral marketing. Right? So for example, <coughs> you have beautiful formulation of Kleinberg with my colleague, and uh, 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 the campaign is my colleague, Kleinberg and Tados. And they, for example, tried to formulate a separation between network and the process. Right? They said, you have an underlying social network, then you have some kind of stochastic process <coughs> that is running on the network trying to do influence. For example, if you started with two fellows with three iPhones, then they may have some probability to influence their neighbor, and then they may have continuous propagation of the probability to influence the neighbor, and somewhere, eventually, they stop the influence, then they will say this is a stochastic influence from these two numbers, right? So this clearly is a very cleanly defined dynamic process. And it's not just graph structure, it's really this stochastic process is going on at work, right? So, so I would like to take a simple step back, at least ask the following simple question, mathematically. That is, uh, what are the interplay between dynamic process and the networks that somehow impact our way to think about network concepts and network solutions? So that's the broad picture. And particularly, I will just focus on one simple problem today in the talk, that is, uh, what is the impact of an influence model on network centrality? Right. So I have a network, <coughs> and Dave Kemper, uh, Kleinberg, and Tadosh gave me a model. Then we try to say who is more important in this process. Right. So if you think a little bit about this, page rank is not your solution anymore, because page rank is independent of influence process. Right, so, so it's kind of cool that suddenly you have a problem, the most popular formulation of centrality is not the answer. Right, unless you believe centrality should be independent of the model. It's only dependent on the model. Right, so it's a simple question, right? I give you an influence model, I give you a network, what is centrality? Namely, I will want to find a mathematical map to take from a process plus a network into a vector of n that the entries signify the significance of nodes. Is that what centrality is? Loosely speaking, that's what okay. is schematically defined. But semantics, we have to put some semantics there. Right. So for example, page rank is a map from a graph to a vector, mm -hmm. whose sum is equal to 1. There's no entry is negative. Just schematically. Suppose I don't put any semantics in it. Then they say bigger is better. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, so I just want to understand this question. I have influence process, which is stochastic. I have a social network, which is a graph. So this is fit my picture of a network is more than graph. Right? I would like to try to understand. What is centrality? 
So if you really think it rule out essentially any statistically defined central digit, <coughs> like between this, page run, everything somehow didn't quite fit as a solution. Okay? So let me take some simple steps. <coughs> let me give you a very simple example. I would like to, you at least remember this example, then later on you can see how this example played into the analysis. Right? Uh, I think only after I have a daughter, I began to realize on a daily basis, the influence change. You know, the little kid grew up, they really command more of you. So, so suppose you have a simple network. It's just one app between two nodes. And suppose one node has P influence to the other one, and the other node has Q influence to the first one. So intuitively, we need to assign a value to say who has the more centrality. Okay? So intuitively, only thing I knew so far is that when P equal to Q, probably it should have the same centrality. <laughs> right? But if you only look at the edge, clearly, like page rank, you will not be able to tell the difference between P and Q. Okay? So I just want to at least keep in your mind, when P and Q change, how do you assign centrality? <laughs> I just want to leave you in your head, and later on I will come back to this question. Okay? In particular, when P becomes bigger, like Every day, it seems like P become bigger, I become smaller. And how should I change my number? OK? Very simple problem, right? You have a probabilistic process, a graph. You want to get a vector out. So <clears throat> let's go a little bit, another step back, to think about at least what is the underlying mathematics, right? So whenever I give you a Influence process or stochastic process. Is this, good, is this the process you're going to be focusing on for the whole lecture? Uh, this, this is the Kleinberg Cardoche. Yeah, for example. Yeah, yeah. I mean, more, more broadly than, than the definition. Go more broadly than that. No more broadly. Yeah, no, more, not more, broadly. More, more Yeah, but this will be the intrinsic. After this slide, there's no more generalization. Okay. Okay. So, so whenever you know, KKT gave you a model, they can be complicated. I don't want to study anything my colleagues study, so I don't read their detail. But I want to find an underlying way to define them, right? So in many ways, the underlying map of mathematics is not defined on the network itself. It's really defined on the power set. So in fact, they define a power set of network. Why? Because what is the influence process, essentially they define for every set S, what is the probability is influence T? another set. So it's really defined a graph on this power set. Huge. And this clearly is complete information. Whatever David's uh, KKT model gave it to you, I can produce this table if I don't care about the computation. Right? More general. Eh? This is a more general model. This is, but you know, they, you know they focus on process and I give you a, the fundamental interplay. Right? This table captures the interplay. Precisely capturing. There's no more data loss, right? Because I gave you S and P, you need to write out the probability, which they can, because they give a succinct representation to do that. It's sharp P completely write this table, but if as a mathematician, who cares? Let me just give you this table. Okay? So in some sense, centrality formulation is really about from this table to do a dimensional reduction into one dimensional vector. This is really the mathematical problem, right? Can I have a map from this table to a vector with certain properties? Okay. So, <clears throat> so if you read the KKT in the uh, Kemper uh, Kleinberg Tadas paper, they quickly pivot away from process. They said actually what they want to study is called the so-called influence spread. So how do they define influence spread? They basically said for every set, you want to measure the uh, expect the influence. So that's a called influence spread. <coughs> right? So this is the, another way to think about it, interplay, right? I gave you a process, I gave you a graph. They said fundamentally they see the data this way. It just, I see the other data as a more fundamental way because that data defines this data. So this I view as dimensional reduction from the probability map to a utility map. So, 
the last few years, you know, uh, Papa Dimitri taught most of computer scientists game theory, so I also get into that study of game theory, Nash equilibria, uh, different games, markets. And uh, suddenly when I look at this model, when David first mentioned it, I, I still look at it as utility. But suddenly when I look at this model, I said, uh, hey, all they define is a game. So in fact, what they define is a cooperative game studied in the 50s. What is cooperative game? It's exactly this. That is for every group, you have a utility. What, for every group, you can tell how much money they make. Right, that's the utility. Or for every group, you, have, you tell how much political powers they have collectively, right? So in many ways, social influence can be strictly mapped as a game on the subsets. Okay, so once you take this simple view, then there was one classical definition of centrality. That was studied in the 50s. It's called Shapley Valley. So unfortunately, Shapley just passed away a few months, I think within a month. He was professor at UCLA for many, many years, and uh, he took a fall, had you know, broke his hip, and then suddenly he passed away. And uh, you know, Shapley had many beautiful contributions. This is just one of the facets of his work. So essentially, <coughs> at his time, they mostly talk about this political game or economical game of cooperation. That's why for economical game, they need to distribute utilities, fairly distributed utilities. And for political game, they want to measure the power index of individuals in the voting, right? And he proposed a formula, which in modern days look very simple now. He said, here is one way to measure the individual power. That is, uh, imagine that uh, they are all asked to randomly come to CMU, one at a time, randomly. And then people come into this room, and suppose you came in this random order, then he will just simply measure what's the, the utility of the group including you minus the utility without including you. So called the expected margin to the contribution, marginal contribution. So this is the so-called famous Shapley value. It reduced a cooperative game into a single vector. So in, so in that formula, sigma is given. Sigma is given. Sigma is a utility. Arbitrary function. Pardon me? Sigma is an arbitrary function. Sigma yeah. is an arbitrary function map from ma a set to a real number. And how, did, how, how is S pi new? Uh, uh, as a, a pi is a random permutation. Yeah. S pi v is the people before you. Oh. So this means that uh, people before you have a utility, you came, you have additional utility, marginal. Then he said, let's take the expectation of this. Okay. So in many ways, if you look at this, it seems to be at least a plausible formulation of centrality for social influence. Right, because from KKT perspective, you have seen social influence process, then the sigma is well defined because of this influence model. And then Shapley came back to define this in individual power. So Shapley value had many beautiful properties. He actually has a complete axiomatization study of this. For example, of all the maps, this is the only map satisfying the following condition. Efficiency, namely you divide the value of the total sets. Symmetry means that if two people are same marginal against every set, they will receive the same power index. Linear means that if you have stochastic, you know, Bayesian uh, utility, or you have two utility, you take the sum, then Shapley value will take the sum, it's a linear. And no players means that if you have no mar you have no utility in every sense, against every sense, you will be mapped to zero. Then this is the only solution to proof. It's beautiful. it's beautiful. The proof actually is beautiful. You will see a little bit of reflection on this. <coughs> so let me summarize. Essentially, I would like to take the first step and just study this. At least I want to characterize this. Namely, if I have social influence model, I will come with the social influence game, which actually I didn't even define. And then I will study this 
potential measures. This measure is a potential centrality measure. So I think this really shaped to be a beautiful problem, right? Because nothing I define. I love to study things. I don't define anything, right? The graph to model social network was defined in 1700s. Social influence was defined in 50s and redefined in 2000s. And Shapley value was, cooperative game was defined in 50s. And uh, it's wonderful just you know, to look at all the things the giant build and you just try to admire when you put them together, how beautiful they can be, okay? So basically I would like to do a little bit of examination of these combinations. Okay, so this basically as my first humbling step to study the interplay between social influence process and network centrality, okay? So we are in the modern days, right? We no longer 50, 60, 70 years <coughs> old. <coughs> what is modern days? We are network science and bigger data, right? So, you know, I'm just serious. In the age of people study network science and the big data. And uh, so if you ask what are the assets we want to study, I think two of the essence of modern days is that uh, a solution should be mathematically meaningful. At least you can mathematically justify them or at least characterize them. And the other type is you have to algorithmically compute them. So we like to have efficient solutions that are mathematically meaningful. Right? That's why in some sense, page rank is good enough solution. It's mathematically kind of justified, and you can compute it efficiently. Right? If you connect with a business, it could be millions of dollars. Right? So, so, so I would like to at least focus upon how to take a step in mathematical meaningful is and, and this is, is more natural for us, right? So let me focus on the simpler one, the algorithmic one. I will return to the mathematical one. Okay, so this way you will get more familiar with the formulation. Okay. <coughs> so, so I claim that uh, Shapley value can be a, a scalar body a, approximate in a lot of instance. We still didn't get approximate in every instance, but it, we can approximate in a sort of larger class of instance, okay? So let me just share with you at least the basic step to take that. And this is actually the lighter part of the discussion. So the most general model, actually, if you read the KKT, what they propose is a so-called triggering model for influence. So triggering model, like this picture show, is that uh, there's a set of nodes can trigger you to be active. That's something you want to buy iPhone. Right, so essentially, what happened is that uh, <coughs> you look at yourself, you look at all the in neighbor, and this stochastic process will take subsets. And those will become your triggering sets. If any of them become active, you will become active. And this model happened to be the, one of the most general models capture many other classical models, like so-called independent cascade, or some kind of linear threshold, and many other models. So it's a beautiful elementary model, but KKT would heavily depend upon its mathematical structure. Okay? So it's a very simple model, right? Every node, basically, look at your in neighbor, there's a probability distribution, we activate the subset, and you can be activated if one of you, that set is activated. So you have some initial set, they will just propagate. This is a cascade of influence, okay? So, so this, if you look at mathematically, it actually has a more deterministic connotation. Namely, after you sample this triggering set, you have this life edge graph, right? Who influenced whom, who activated, and the influence suddenly just becomes reachability. For example, if you have two people with iPhone, they already can influence the people they can reach now in this life graph. And this distribution of life graph defines the distribution of influence. And this actually is the essence of all the Kemper, Klemberg, Tadosh proof. Then they prove, like, um, for certain, like, for, for, for the uh, uh, influence spread, the submodularity is on this, and the convex combination of submodularity is still submodular, then they, 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 they move down, right? So their proof essentially breaks down into this decomposition, okay? <coughs> and so essentially they connect the probability of influence with the probability of reachability in the life graph. 
That's all the mathematics actually behind KKD. I think that's why it's a beautiful result. It's, it's simple. It's beautiful result. So, so what is the randomness over? The uh, over when you choose a subset who can influence you. There's a distribution design among your neighbors, like Gary and uh, Danny, who want to take care of you. And the subset that was chosen, if they are happy, then you will be happy too. Okay, so that's the basic this model. Okay? <clears throat> so one thing which I hinted a little bit last yesterday in my other talk is that uh, it seems like for a lot of this Markov chain influence, it's actually more beneficial to think in the other direction, the reverse direction. Instead of saying who can influence whom, it's better to study who can be influenced by whom. So somehow this reverse direction has a lot of mathematical meanings. Okay? So, so if you look at this reverse structure, for example, you can start a random nodes, and you can look at who can influence you in this triggering model, then they will give you these pieces of, uh, in this triggering model, here is a life path that can influence me. And if you do again, because it's all stochastic, somebody else could be in reversely influenced by this node, and so on. So this type of pieces <coughs> is called a reverse influence subset. And in many ways, a lot of algorithm for influence maximization are all built upon this type of structures, how they are connected with influence spread and how they are connected with other structures. So all the, most of the study just studied, the modern did. KKT didn't realize this. This is actually after KKT. They, 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 they always go forward, they, they miss this structure. Then when people began to look backward, they see many beautiful structures. Okay. So for example, the first use is by <coughs> The first four, they, they, they gave the first scalable influence maximization algorithm. They showed that the KKT can be inf implemented in basically in scalable fashion, just by looking at those reverse process. Okay? It's, it's powerful. It suddenly changes the, the, the whole computation. And for example, this all polished, if you combine with uh, Martingale, it becomes much more beautifully done now. Right? This, this continues to beautify it here. For us, I would like to build estimators for Shapley value. Right? So in, in some sense, it's very natural for us to examine those structures. And we realize, actually, oh, this is my philosophical map of reverse influence. If you look how much water flows into the ocean, you really want to figure out the other direction. So it turns out the Shapley value has a, this beautiful identity. It, this just come out from formulation. It almost doesn't need much proof anymore. It shows that <coughs> the Shapley value of a node is the expected value when you draw one of these random influence sets. You just contribute 1 over r if you're in the reverse set. So how do you draw a, re a reverse set? You choose a random node, and you randomly trace back this influence triggering model. And then there's this uh, reverse set. And if, if you are in that random trace back, you score 1 over r. And if you take expectation times n, this is Shapley value. It's remarkably true. There's no approximation here. So that's why this gave an unbiased estimator for Shapley value. So that's how beautiful those influence models are. They just come out like this. So, so this basically leads to a classification <coughs> of scalable algorithm, which I will not already go in. Basically, under certain quite condition often occurring practice, then you can, you can compute this to arbitrary precision in almost a linear time. Okay. So I don't want to bore you into the more detail of it now, but I just want to give you a sketch. Right? Basically, those reversible set catch enough information for unbiased estimator, and you just need to do this robustly. At some point afterwards. Okay. So let me return to this question, which I would like to study as a mathematical question, axiomatization. Okay. So <clears throat> I would like to understand mathematically what do what does Shapley value of a cooperative social influence game actually reflect? I really want to characterize this. Right? 
you know, it's nice you can compute them, approximate them. If nobody cares, then let's just use this algorithm. Right? At least I feel for myself, I would like to understand what is actually reflect, what property it has. Right? So, so again, I will go through, for example, sharp this channel, or the channel of uh, uh, ultimate uh, tenant host for axiomatized page rank, and the variety of work for axiomatized so-called intellectual influence. There's many beautiful paper on those things. They try to find out what is the best way to measure who is the most influential one, and this way we can give a Turing Award or give Knuth's Prize. Maybe we should just run around with this because the value is bigger, we just give to the person. Right. Uh, so this is basically try to mathematically characterize each of the ranking system. Okay. So, so, so let's start with some very simple properties that uh, intuitively need them to be true, and hopefully they are true. Right? We, we need them, so intuitively we want to have a desirable property that we can explain. We want them to be true. So those are all simple. You, you know, it, there's nothing complex right now. So intuitively, if you permute the label of network, centrality should just permute it long Right? If you, your centrality measure doesn't have that property, I think you should explain why it doesn't have that property, rather than why it has this property. Right? Because if I permute map Gary to Allen, then the, the centrality just map to there. The name is not important. Right? We're talking about network data and influence. You can label one, two, three, four, you can A, B, C, D. There's no matters. Right? So if you permute, you should permute. Okay? So this, normally people look at this and say, clearly that should be true. Nobody disputes this thing. As I go down, clearly you will argue with me more why that doesn't make sense. Okay? So I'm prepared to admit that it's not as perfect as this one. Now, right? But if you dispute this, then I will try to fight the back hard. Right? This is the principle. <laughs> okay? So what's the second principle? is also in places used in the page rank. But after all, rank is only about how to order people in order, or give a order the information. How you scale is only, it's not matters. If I give you a centrality map, I scale them, it's still the same map, I claim. So with this regard, why don't we just have an axiom to say you have to average equal to one? Namely, if you have a network with n nodes, you have n dollars to distribute. On average, everyone gets their one dollar back. Right? So let's just make it explicit. Otherwise, it's very hard to compare different measurements. Now let's scale them. Okay? So this, usually people look at me and say, no problem. I including my most pra uh, uh, applied friend. They said, uh, yeah, they should be normalized. Okay? They should be normalized. Okay. So let me go on to the next very simple case. Is that in every society, there's loners. They don't participate in society. They cannot be influenced by nobody. They don't influence anybody. So this I call isolated nodes. Right? So we have to make up our mind how much centrality they deserve. And uh, so those are basically mathematical conditions of isolated nodes. They basically have no impact. In every group, they totally have no influence. For example, where S plus U is only the influence of S. Okay? So intuitively, because we, after we normalize to one, they should get the one back, right? Because they, they contribute the one to the input, and they, they influence nobody, they should get the one back. Okay. So, so far, when I talk to them with my social choice, uh, social science friend, no one said uh, that's horrible yet. They all said that's a good idea. Okay, they sum to one. They sum it to n. Oh, Average so one. Uh, that's why they get the one back. Uh, get the one back. So even loners has, life, uh, has value in the society, <coughs> right? They have their own value. Okay? Anyone wants to dispute them? For now, I, uh, I, I like no argument. <laughs> Because of the network coming in here? Huh? When you say isolated, you're applying an edge or something? Oh, no, no, no. It's just in this probabilistic map. Okay. Because that's why I define in this. I didn't define in the graph theoretical way. Good. I define using my power set network, right? Because that is a ground truth to me. Okay. That is the interplay data, right? So let me give you another boundary case. 
this case we can dispute a little bit because I, I like to improve this axiom, but I, I'm open-minded here. Uh, the other three, I'm not open-minded. I think they are right. They are right axioms. Okay. So this basically I define as a sync node. <laughs> Every society has losers. <laughs> I shouldn't say that way. <laughs> they have no impact to others, but others could influence them. You know, for example, whenever my daughter screamed, I feel like I'm that node. <laughs> I have no influence on my daughter. And she just screamed at me. Right? So, so you can mathematically define what is a sync node. Sync node basically means that uh, uh, if you put yourself here, you actually have nothing to do with the influence. It's just us did all the influence. So basically, this it's one way to measure in this probabilistic <coughs> way, you actually have a zero impact for other people to move forward, other than perhaps collect yourself. That, that's called sync. So this implies that you can only influence yourself because that's the only probability you get on yourself individually. Right. <coughs> so the reason I, I write down this implication is just to prove that this is a reasonable definition because you want to say individually you can only influence yourself. But as a group, you can only help. If they don't influence you yet, you can say, I'm, he I'm here. By the way, I'm here, right? So that you can put yourself in. That's why you have these two terms. OK? So a big number is good? Huh? Huh? Bigger number. Big number. So probably a bigger number is good, yeah. OK. So, so we have this axiom, which I'm still trying to beautify it, but I, so, so you can decide what is reasonable. So once I have a, 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 a sync node, intuitively you can project them out. You can just mass, uh, probabilistically just uh, project the, the, the influence out. Uh, uh, suppose you try to remove the node and you can build the equivalent probabilistic map. Now, nothing else changed actually. We, you, you captured the original influence model. So what we would like to say is that uh, <coughs> The independent of sync node means that imagine a network has two sync nodes. If you project on node one, we want to see the centrality of the second sync node didn't change. We didn't even care about the centrality of the other node didn't change. We just said the centrality of the second node didn't change. So intuitively, you have two nodes. Nobody has influence nobody. Okay, just one small point. So, so the. If you're an isolated node, that's to say you have no influence on anybody, right? Yeah, yeah. No, uh, influence no, uh, isolated node are sync nodes. Exactly. And then you get a value one. Yes. It's, but th that means that if there are people with um, value more than one, yes, there are. Th then there people are, have value less than one. Then there are people value and and, and and people that influence people have value. Yeah, yeah. For example, when my daughter influenced me, I have no influence on my daughter. Intuitively, I have I have value less than one, right? Because we are splitting two dollars. We all agree my daughter is more important now. Then I have to have value less than one. I am sync. Yeah, but then you've got people. But, but if I don't have a daughter, I'm one, right? So that's why sometimes we don't have children, right? But you have people with no influence having more value, influence, people having a higher weight than people with no right, influence. Right, because it's really about how much people can influence, right? So intuitively, if my daughter couldn't influence me, I'm isolated, I'm one, because uh, I really have in some higher margin of value. So, the, 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 so this axiom says that if you have two such sync nodes, they really are independent. You know, you can project the one, the other one doesn't change. Okay. So, so, so far, this one actually, I, every day when I reread my paper, I, I try to figure out a better one, but I, so this is as good as I get so far, you know. I, I admit some of the limitation here. <coughs> so next one, so I have six altogether. So next one, it's also very natural called the Bayesian social influence. This is also classically defined. They said, what is Bayesian social influence? Like Bayesian game, Bayesian, you know, Bayesian everything these days, right? Bayesian machine learning. Uh, essentially says that uh, imagine you have a fixed social network. There could be several influence models, right? Because you can sell iPhones, you can sell medical device, you can sell uh, insurance, you can sell knowledge. Right? So then they all follow their own different influence process. And suppose there's a state of nature distribution among which may occur. And suppose it's a basic model, just uh, you first flip a coin to decide which model will apply, then you apply that model. 
So this is called the Bayesian influence. You can write out this probability is literally the convex combination of <coughs> that. That's it's just defined based on the definition. Right? So the axiom basically says that uh, the centrality obey the linearity of expectation. That when you have Bayesian model without any other knowledge, the centrality is really just the expected centrality in each of those models. I'm happy to argue about this too. This is a, I'm open minded on this too. Why don't I show you the last one? Then we can, if you want to revisit this view, I can come back to it too. So the last one is really related to the picture now, which I started with the two nodes network. Right? So I would like to examine this a little bit, and I, I would like to post a reasonable axiom to at least capture this very boundary case. Right. So, <coughs> So we intuitively agree if P is bigger than Q, then my daughter should have more influence. That's centrality. And uh, what happened? What happened? Just a second. Don't look at my email. <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry about that. I, it's not a bad email. It's not part of that. Uh, this is not uh, so, 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 so we all kind of say if P equal to Q, we should get a 1-1. One, one. I want just you, I don't know how many have the proposal now. I would like to consider extreme case. This actually sometimes happened to me. You know, that is my daughter has a 100% influence to me. I have zero influence to her at a particular moment. So at least I would like to understand what should be our issue centrality. Isn't that just a case you're a sink? Yeah, I am a sink, yeah. But I only said that if I have I two sink. An axiom for this. Huh? No, I only said that I have two sink, I can remove one of the sink. I didn't say how one sink is a score. Oh, I, see, I, see. I only think there's two sink I can project one out. Right. If, if you know, if my wife is also a sink, then we can remove one. So it's only isolating the, this case now. Okay. So, so how do we assign value? I, I think, you know, this actually, when I chat with people, it's very interesting. People have different theory of assign this. And eventually, they all convert to the same value. You know, they all discuss, 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 then, you know, I often just walk around, I tell people this game. <laughs> and somehow, they all eventually come back with the same value. Right. So how do we assign this? So who has, who assigned numbers already? <coughs> Two and zero. Two and zero. Okay, that's one thing. So my daughter just get, get. <laughs> that's how I feel too. My daughter get everything. I get nothing. But intuitively, that is not the answer because I can still influence myself. So I, I'm not just totally become zero intuitively. In centrality, you know, this influence centrality. <coughs> but you really feel like two and zero. That's how I feel at parents. Okay, so intuitively, I'm uh, some kind of bigger than zero, but smaller than one. We need we need to settle about it. So, this Can you it, put self loops in your model or not? Uh, yeah, yeah, influence model ha all has all the self loops, yeah. It's just a so probability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here I have no self loop. I just, I have, yeah. So, since I have been keep on asking people from 50s, let's ask you again. People in 50s are brilliant. Right? Let's chat, please. Let's, uh, let's ask another 50 people. <coughs> so, he's out. Alumni from CMU, and he lived in the 50s. <coughs> His name is John Nash. So when Nash was become uncertain on things, he said, "Let's bargain." He's, you know, the best mathematician who understand the business, right? Let's bargain. Okay. So how Nash will do? Nash will say, "This is how I tell you how to bargain." Nash will walk to my daughter and say. How much do you think your father worth in this centrality game? I have two dollars. So if you look at me, she said uh, he worth nothing. <laughs> <That's what> the, <laughs> right? You know, I can influence him. He, he's not important. And now she will say, okay, so your default value is zero, indeed, because your daughter said he worth nothing. Then he will ask me to say, how much do you think your daughter worth in this uh, $2 split? 
And I look, I said, I can only influence myself. I couldn't influence her. That's a lost cost. I will see what's at least one. Right? Because at least I can influence myself, you know, see what's at least one. So he called this a critical value of bargaining. This is the default value for bargaining. So basically, in the default, <coughs> Sonia has one, I have zero. Then now she said, let's bargain for the last dollar. She said, given your default, let's bargain for the other dollar. That's basically not the bargaining principle. Right? Then now she said, how do you bargain the last dollar? That in this time, you are equal or not? You're just all bargaining for this dollar without any other thing, no? Then he said, how about you get half and she get half? So that's why she got 1.5, you get one. So this is called notch bargaining. It has a set of axioms point to here. That's why people are derive from different solutions. Sometimes they give the same solution. So notch bargaining, he will say, in this extreme case, the father gets a half, the daughter gets 1.5. Actually, Shapley by the way did exactly the same thing. So, you know, we are parents, we are smart people. We don't want to give in to our parents, kids. So let me understand a little bit more of this game. So how do you improve your centrality in your family? You become tiger parents. So you heard about tiger parents? They, they basically eventually make sure the kid has no influence. <laughs> tiger parents, right? So in this case, suddenly I'm 1.5 and Sonia becomes <coughs> 0.5. That, I really want to have that family so that I have you my daughter will learn, they do the good thing, and uh, I have a lot of influence in the home. Right. But unfortunately, most of the home have many people. It's just not one people. Actually, more than two. You have, once you have grandparents, it's a lost cost. <laughs> right? So let's just think about two, right? Often, how do one, one tiger bargain with the two tigers? Right? It's not just the, the whole theory about this thing, actually. Right? So intuitively, you could have many parents, right? Uh, how many remember this beautiful movie called <coughs> Three Man and the Baby? And uh, clearly, that's a very different influence model, right? So, <coughs> so, so let me define a so-called critical set instance to extend it uh, to a two-node network. That is, uh, <coughs> you have a center called the child, and you have a group of parents. And if our parents agree, they will influence the child. And if you're missing one of the parents, you cannot influence that kid. That actually often happens, right? One, the moment I, I only said, both me and the mommy said, you have to do this. Then she said, is it sure? But if I said, you have to do this, they said, that's me, ask mommy. <laughs> right? So, so, so if all parents are great, you influence the kids. If no parents, are, if one of them was not there, then you have no influence of the kid, right? So that's, if you write down probabilities like this, okay. Tri trivial case, right? So I would like to understand how do we assign <coughs> centrality here. And Nash actually has a theory to essentially say, those people as parents really treat as a group, but they just have a less in, uh, negotiation index. They have, they have less power in negotiation because they have to agree before they negotiate. So they, they are much weaker agent than the child. Child just behave on her own, parent has to agree. Right. So, uh, I don't know how many parents are here, how many children are there. Enjoy your children's time, you have a lot of power right now. Uh, so, if parents are united, the kid really follow. And if the parents are, uh, disagree, then the kid will become, uh, I don't know, a monster. So, that's basically, so, so that's why parents have a weaker power. And much formula, if you form, formulate the power index, he said that uh, in this game, the child actually don't lose much. The child will be R divided by R plus one. He said R is power index. This is how the bargaining happened. So notch basically has the whole theory to say it should be here. Right. So, so I will take a notch, uh, you know, you have to listen to people in the 50s, so I, I, I take a notch uh, uh, assumption to say, once you have this critical set instance, the child will get one over R, uh, R over R plus one, one minus one over R plus one. So these are six axioms. Uh, over a certain time, we, after we chat to people, we think ourselves. And uh, 
So here's what I would like to say. It provides an asymmetric characterization of Shapley centrality. Namely, the social influence Shapley centrality, which I defined, is a unique centrality measure that satisfies this. Which means that uh, it has soundness, namely, it satisfies this, it has completeness. The solution to this is unique. It's, it's Shapley centrality. So since Gary had to go to class, I will be very brief uh, to say, it's actually proof, a very beautiful proof. That is, we follow, in simplicity, we follow Meyerson's proof of Chapman's value. Essentially, you try to create a vector space. You use your axiom to build the basis. It's a linear algebra, actually, after all. Then you try to prove axiom <coughs> solution is a linear map. And then basically, on each boundary instance, if the, the, the basis is unique, then the whole thing is unique. That's basically Chapman's uh, uh, uniqueness uh, from another person, fellows from 50s. And uh, so, 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 so actually, in our case, it's more complicated than uh, this proof because we, we can't deal with the, uh, the, the, the utility value. We actually deal with the probability. So we, have, we are in much, much bigger dimensions. So it creates some subtle difficulty. So basically, we are running a much higher dimension than Shapley value because we want to capture from the probabilistic model. We don't want to capture from influence product model. Right. But nevertheless, you know, you can make the puzzle fit. And it's a quite elegant linear algebraic proof. You can prove that this six axiom, you may disagree with some, at least for now, uniquely ID the Shapley centrality. Okay. So, 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 so this just goes through dimension. I'm not going up. You know, you guys are good in linear algebra. I don't have, you know, you can easily figure those things out. And uh, essentially, we have no instance. It's basically everyone's isolated. We have basis instance. is this uh, extended uh, many parents against children game. But this, you can use a sink to expand. And then <coughs> we have a general instance. We can express general instance as a linear combinations. Actually, uh, Often combinations of the other two instances. So that's essentially the style of proof. So this actually gave a very beautiful map of how many uh, dimensional reduction happened from probability space to utility space to centrality space. And uh, they actually take each level of uh, dimensional reduction. And this provides, at least with respect to this, a consistently enough reduction. Right. Dimensional reduction is very challenging because you often lose information in your arbitrary manner. Right. So this at least allows you to have some consistency in that. And uh, so I'm, since uh, I'm running out of time, so why don't I just forget about experiments because uh, I'm serious. So, uh, but that lets me point to one thing. Actually, it's good to do experiments because we discover a theorem from experiments. A theorem is the following. If you have a symmetric independent, independent cascade game, uh, uh, influence model, namely, you have undirected graph, you have probability equal on each side as an influence model. And remarkably, our experiment keep on saying that all the uh, Shapley value is the same. At the beginning, we didn't quite believe that. They said, you know, it's kind of weird. But actually, very quickly, we get proof to say, indeed, that's true. Uh, why is it interesting? Because uh, at the beginning, it looked very surprising and counterintuitive. But then when I was reading literature, many people are using this instance to do experiments. They, you know, they run experiments because they, they, they artificial try to produce influence models. They just say, oh, it's easy to produce a random <laughs> graph with uh, symmetric edges, symmetric probability. And they didn't realize this is a really special influence model. Perhaps it never happened in practice. Right, so in some sense, Shapley centrality uh, sharply point out that, uh, <coughs> you know, the market. Is, is that the same basic theorem that if you have a degree, a graph with a constant degree, then a random walk is uniform? Uh, it's not related with that, but it's more, because it's a marginal utility, where you have a complete graph, a connected graph with no probability, then everybody's equal. Because from every node, you can reach every node. So this, this is really related with that phenomenon, okay. right? Because it's really about stochastic reachability. And, and the people write papers about the, under this assumption, we can improve influence maximization. They didn't tell why. They just said our algorithm is fine-tuned to 
you know, even this beautiful case, uh, uh, it turned out this is really special case, you know, from Shapley lens, right? It's just, this is just utterly symmetric case. Right? Shapley value literally says you are symmetric because all the Shapley value is the same. <coughs> and, and if you do a proof, it's actually kind of cute. If you want a straightforward proof, it's not trivial. You have to go through these life graph things. Okay. <coughs> right proof, it, you have to see that your mirror graph, wow, it's all matched. So, so essentially, I hope this gives you, uh, you know, some, some basic, uh, I want to share with you some of the steps I would like to take, try to understand more of the, you know, uh, I try to graduate from graph theory into network theory. Mm -hmm. So which means I would like to understand a little bit more what beyond graph that uh, either algorithmically or mathematically I would like to understand because I find it's a very beautiful object, right? And, um, so there's many possible extensions. None of my axioms is that perfect. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I really feel that uh, the holy grail of natural science, now at least I can take a step to say, is really try to understand you know, what is analyzed, the sparse and the multifaceted network data we see. So thank you very much. Any, any questions? Yeah, the question. So uh, I see like two main differences between uh, your characterization and the original Shapley characterization. Okay. One is that the Shapley like only relates this to the underlying utilities, whereas your characterization to the probabilities. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the second is that while two of the axioms are exactly like the Shapley axioms, the, the, the efficiency, which is the dollar one, and the linearity, which is corresponds to the Bayesian. That's right. Uh, it's not clear. But where the other two Shapley actions relate to the other four Right, they don't always completely fall, but the null essentially related with the thing, the, the independent right, right. null. Null is essentially corresponding to the right. independent. Right. So, like, uh, can you make some comments on like where the difficulty comes from? Is it like the, the going back to the probability space? Is that what makes this difficult or is it... Yeah, the main thing I'm continuing to struggle trying to figure out what is the cleanest way to capture this stochastic right. behavior. And that's why this is something that I feel like my attempt to come up with, uh, uh, you know, if you look at axiomatization study fundamentally, the purpose is that A, you want to list all your desirable properties. You want to decide whether you have a solution or not. If you don't, you have to decide why you compromise some properties, right? Like voting and like error impossibility theorem or the Kleinberg's um, uh, impossibility for clustering. They all have a limitation, but they are, major things try to list what you think is desirable that they want to examine the situation. And the other type is basically like this, or uh, Shapley, or PageRank. Essentially, the people have already uh, a possible candidate as a solution. And, uh, and they find it mathematically meaningful to at least succinctly capture what you assume. But otherwise, people will overclaim, right? That's why, uh, you know, Arrow eventually is uh, he, Arrow used to say, I don't design election scheme. I know nothing about the election scheme. It's just every time I talk, people say something, I just don't believe them anymore because they said, uh, you know, uh, what do you mean follow people's will? If everyone agrees, do you agree? Right? So he began to ask this very simple question. Right? Then people always say yes. So everything he says, you know, it's democracy consistency. And it doesn't matter how he formulates it, people just say yes because they, they think it's good. And that's when he realized when you put it all, all together clearly, someone exaggerated, right? Then he said, I, since I don't design election scheme, I just want the people to re-exam to say why this thing is not that important or why it should be compromised because this is a sort of practical approximation of ideal, right? So here basically, too, I'm, that's why I, you feel of my axiom, I don't feel it somehow is beautiful enough because sometimes you hack a little bit, right? Because I have a solution which means Shapley centrality, and then really try to capture its facets. But I want to capture with the simple facets. And hopefully you say, uh, these simple facets actually already anchor your solution. And if you don't like those simple facets, you should examine other solutions. And if you try to argue other solutions are great, then you can use this as a comparative framework, try to argue basically why they actually possibly miss some reasonable Formulation, right? So, so this gave I think a more systematic way to examine 
some very complex dimensional reduction phenomena, right? Because it's a, like voting too, right? It's dimensional reduction. So you can see uh, clustering too, right? So it, the all basic dimensional reduction. The data is so big, and you want to have a succinct representation of a concept. And then you have to drop something. You, then one of the fundamental issues is the fairness and its consistency. So. Any other questions? Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I've heard that. So let's say you want to do a maximization. Mm -hmm. um, and you computed like the Chapel 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 for everyone. Would you pick like the highest? They actually, uh, uh, one of my experiments showed they actually, for a lot of network, they are quite, uh, they have quite good uh, uh, performance, but clearly, you know, for symmetric one, they should have no performance. Yeah, right, this is what it is. Right, so that's why often actually they actually track, uh, because this really show you the, the influence, particularly on the learner model. You know, people learn this influence probability using other secondary data. And on those data, actually, the Shapley value is doing even better because somehow they track better with, uh, yeah. But, but I'm not trying to argue right now is that this is the way to, because influence maximization is a different game, right? Basically, you want to choose a few seeds and, and, and you have a very limited uh, size of seeds, right? Yeah, so in, intuitively, they shouldn't be completely correlated. Okay, thanks a lot. <laughs>